cultural experience here in Peru. Mm -hmm. um, do you hear me okay like this? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Um, so when I was thinking about doing this talk, I was thinking, how can I talk about leadership in a way that it's entertaining, that it's fun? Because many times when we talk about leadership, we fall into commonplace. Um, so I figured the best way to have a conversation with people who are on the trenches, people who are rolling their sleeves and facing the real dilemmas of Oh, sure. Ah, okay, okay. So, sorry, apologies. It's the it's the teacher in me. <laughs> so, I thought you, the best way to do this will be to have a conversation with people who are in the trenches, um, and that's what we're gonna do. So we have two wonderful speakers to share with us the stories about what I call an impossible activity. And I seriously believe that leadership is an impossible activity, much like what Freud, Freud said, Sigmund Freud said, about teaching, governance, and of course, psychoanalysis. So we're here to talk about the real dilemmas and the real imperfections of leadership. And we're gonna try to give it a context within some of the uh, Latin American struggles that we have, which are shared by many countries, such as violence against women, of course, corruption, inequality, etc. So let me introduce to you the two wonderful people who we have here. And not only are they wonderful, but they're also wonderful friends. Uh, Sara Cifuentes. Sara has an expertise in communication and an expertise in development. imperfection. See, this is the real life. <laughs> this is what happens. Um, and um, Sara also has a master's degree in social management and a certificate in international mediation and conflict resolution. Sara is currently the manager for Ta Taller de los Niños, TANI, which is an NGO that serves underprivileged families in San Juan de Lurigancho, a real a real uh, a, a struggling area of uh, of Lima. In, and we have Alberto Velaunde. Alberto, he's a lawyer with a master's degree in planification and environmental management. Alberto is one of the, our youngest congressmen in Peru, and he's one of two openly gay congressmen in uh, currently active. In, in our government. Uh, he's a writer of the book Beyond the Rainbow, uh, which talks about the um, authorities and leaders at, on the LG uh, TV community in Latin America. So please welcome our two speakers, and I hope we have a wonderful conversation with them, uh, just to share with you some of the, how we're gonna handle this. We're gonna have a conversation, the three of us, and then maybe in the last 10 minutes, we'll open it up for questions from you guys, okay? So without further ado, let's, let's come in. Okay. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Sara. Sara, what are the daily leadership struggles that you find in Taller de los Niños? That's a hard question. So, uh, hi everyone. So in Taller de los Niños we are about 100 people that are working there, so it's an NGO that works full time. Um, for me, the biggest challenges are for the team to keep it very real, 
to be very vulnerable because we expect them to be very professional, but at the same time, be really in touch about what they are feeling and how they are feeling with people. And I think that's very complex for any human being to be sure that they can keep being professional, but at the same time, keep being very emotional. So for one side is the part of the professionals that I work with. And the second part is facing injustice in the way that we are facing it every day. So seeing kids that are dying for things that we can prevent, uh, women that are suffering violence sure that we can create alliances in the same country or elsewhere to be sure that we can address those kinds of things. I think those are the biggest challenges because you don't necessarily have a way to manage it with yourself. And at the end of the day, it can be very, very hard to just keep going and keep moving forward. Yeah. And for you, Alberto, what are the daily challenges of being in the in the Congress of, of Peru? Well, I, I think that a, a little political context will help to understand my, <laughs> my answer. Um, Peru is a conservative country. Uh, our Congress is really conservative. And one party, which I'm not in, has the majority in that, in that Congress, a, a really big majority. So they don't need to get, um, they, they don't need to, to talk to, to other parties to get things passed. And I think that's like a really important part of the democratic process. So uh, frustration, I think, and uh, how you manage frustration is one of the key parts of any kind of leadership. Um, and for me, uh, I, I learned two things. First, that Sometimes we have like a cinematographic approach to progress. Like if you fight really hard and you have a narrative and you have like um, people on your side, you start winning things and you start moving forward. And the reality is that sometimes you move forward, then you have to take two steps back, then you move right, <laughs> then you move left, then you move a little uh, f forward, and, and it's not like, a, like, like you, you get to keep the progress you made, but you always have to be defending what you got and try to, to, to keep moving your agenda. So it's exhausting. And the second, um, the second thing I learned that is really connected with, with that is that it's very easy to, to develop a cynical approach to stuff. I think that cynicism is a way that sometimes we, we have to deal with problems and avoid frustration. Mm -hmm. But the thing about uh, cynicism is that it can change you. And I see uh, people in, in Congress that, that started with a very idealistic approach of things and start getting cynical. And when you enter that dynamic, it really can change you and you really can uh, stop focusing uh, on the things that motivate you to be there in the first place. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're touching on a, on a fundamental thing, which is how do you keep yourself grounded, particularly when you deal with things such as corruption or such as the amounts of degree of delinquency, poverty, that maybe you, Sara, deal with. Sara, how do you keep yourself anchored? How do you not lose purpose in what you're doing? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's an easy question to, to answer. I think there are a lot of things um, to keep in mind. Um, you have to be very truth to yourself. I think that's when I think about what I do, I keep repeating me what is my purpose because in the way you can always get lost because you meet a lot of people and you meet a lot of people that can give you uh, different things and you have to keep it like your purpose is the one you have in front and that's where you want to go. So I think it's a work with yourself to make sure that you have your purpose 
uh, well placed in your mind and in your heart and that you're able to share it with other people because at the end if it's only your purpose and you're not sharing it with other people you're not gonna make a good leadership or you're not gonna make other people help you do what you want to do so that's the first thing um, the second thing is about being truth to your own values because as Alberto was saying I think the corruption that we have in the government is also something that happens in society in general and uh, people don't understand necessarily that that's corruption so at the end for example when I want to try to work with um, the local government we can see little actions of corruption that don't necessarily feel like corruption but they are and when you try to address them immediately you are seeing like someone who's an enemy who is not willing to work together because you're saying no what we are trying to do is not in that way so I think you have to be very true to your values and surround yourself with people that have the same values not necessarily that think the same way that you're thinking it's important to surround yourself with people that are gonna tell you no that's a mistake you cannot go that way but that their values are the same ones that are gonna push them forward like the ones that you have I think for me that's the things that keep me grounded and at the end of the day when I'm seeing things that I don't like or that make me sad I know next day is gonna be an opportunity to keep doing things um, but it's not easy and you have to be very strong at the same time so yeah um, Alberto one of the things that I, I when I talk to people from who are in positions of great authority like yourself uh, in politics or CEOs CEOs of companies they they assume that um, power is something that will be preserved they, they assume that the role is stays forever how do you um, and I think this is you know this will relate to people all, all over the world because this dynamic is seen all over the world how do you uh, remind yourself that uh, you know it's not you that they're that people are seeking after but it's the role do you do you think about that how do you separate yourself from the role that you are having yeah it, it's really hard but I think one, one thing that really helped me is to uh, talk to other LGBT authorities in Latin America uh, so I made this book last year where I interview uh, 14 uh, openly LGBT congressmen and city councils around Latin America. And the thing is uh, that the, the public objective of the, of the book was to talk about uh, leadership and the LGBT uh, issues in, uh, in our region, but the real uh, objective of, of that was to find a space and people that are uh, living the same things that I'm living and that we, we could have like a, like a space for us to, to, to share our frustrations, to share uh, our dreams, uh, to get advice. And, and when you access that kind of, of, of places, you really notice that it's not you as a person, it's what you represent, especially if you actually represent. It's part of your, of your work title. Sure. Uh, so, so it's it's really really important to have that that kind of uh, of environments because in politics, like a support network. Yes, a support network of people that are struggling with the same things right. that you are struggling, and always try to trying to keep in mind the, the bigger picture, because uh, politics is in, in especially in in countries like like Peru, politics are very. Um, they have a really special dynamic and they're always changing and uh, sure. day to day, in a day to day basis you have to think in five different things at, at the same time so you really need to, to keep in mind who you are, what are you representing and where you want to go because it's, it's like you are uh, in a river, you cannot let you just go with the flow because sure. you are going to end up in a place you don't want to be and Sarah, you know, there's a lot of talk now about women in positions of 
leadership. In Peru, what are the paradigms that you find regarding women in posi positions of leadership like, like yourself? Uh, another hard question. Um, for me, it has been really, really hard. Um, and I guess for other women, it's the same thing. Um, I think we are expected to be a certain way. Um, you know, they expect us to, to be very kind and very, in my case, because I'm working with children and with mothers and with family, they expect me to be very maternal and um, to be very family driven. So as soon as they know, for example, that I'm not married or that I have no children, they are like, but you're 30 years old. Are you sure this is what you want to be like <laughs> pushing forward? So I think. I think that's a big deal, just like the way people expect you to be. And when you're working in an NGO, I don't know if any of you work in NGO or in social projects, they expect you to be a little less strong than you are, ac you are actually. So when people think of me and I say that I'm working in an NGO, they are like, oh, so you're very in contact with your feelings and you're very emotional, you're always like hugging people. They don't really understand what it means to actually run an operation for 30,000 families a year. So um, that's the first thing. So I think going through that barrier is to make sure that I can be strong enough for others um, to show them that even if I'm working in an NGO or even if I'm working towards this goal of making this world a better world, um, that I'm not fragile or necessarily as a bad thing, because I think fragility can be a good thing, but not as a bad thing, that I can be very strong, very serious about what I'm doing, that um, I'm making research, for example. So I think that's a big um, big thing that we have to do, women in general that are working in this. Keep it balanced, the fact that you have to be very vulnerable at the same time, but that you have to show yourself very strong to others and to know that you're going to have a lot of people that are going to see you in a way that you are not necessarily. So, for example, when I have meetings, especially with local governments and especially with men, um, I know how they look at me. And sometimes they don't even say Miss Cifuentes. They are just like, oh, you're such a nice girl. You're so beautiful. And I think you have to stop it just from the beginning. And I know because I have a lot of, um, a lot of friends that work in the same way, not necessarily in NGOs, but also in like entrepreneurship, that this happens a lot of times. So I think it has to do about putting yourself in a position when you have to show actually what you're worth um, without necessarily being like pushy. Because mm -hmm. if you are, you're not going to actually make anything with those people. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's something that is reducing in Latin America, but I think we have a lot of challenges um, because I don't necessarily find people around in, for example, local governments or even in the Congress, people that we can relate to and we can talk without feeling that we are going to be, I don't know, pushed away. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not easy to be a woman in this. Um, if you actually want to make things, it's not easy to be a woman in this work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Alberto, I, I, you know, um, you know, we we live in the context of a, a of a profoundly homophobic uh, society. Um, what are the challenges that you find in that regard in exercising leadership in such a society, being an openly gay congressman? Yeah, I, I always try to, to, to be really conscious of my other privilege when I talk about uh, my, uh, uh, of me being gay because I don't want to, to, to try to sound like the poster boy of discrimination against LGBT because transgender women and transgender men uh, have really a w uh, the worst time here. Also, a lesbian woman have a, a lesbian woman from a rural area had a really more difficult time than me here in Lima, being a man, a cisgender man, being white, and being in, in a position of power. Mm -hmm. So I always try to, to make that framing uh, in the beginning, because I don't want to sound like I'm trying to mm -hmm. 
to to be the represent the, the, the only representation of LGBT uh, people in Peru. Saying that uh, one of the main challenges is to get the LGBT agenda to be taken seriously. For example, there's a lot of, of, of my colleagues in Congress that say, oh, he's a single issue congressman. Uh, he's always talking about uh, that stuff. And um, there's, there are more important stuff to discuss in Congress. And it's funny, because if I were a businessman that, were, that, that was elected to, to Congress, and I decided to talk about how to generate jobs, and my main agenda would be economic growth, nobody would say, ah, uh, oh, you only talk about that, because uh, it's legitimate. When they say I'm a single issue congressman, they are saying, and uh, the, the, sub the, the subtext there is, and your agenda is not important. So you're trying to, to put in the same level as other uh, really big issues in, in the country, uh, I think that it's not important. And when people try to, to, to make a ranking of, of uh, agendas, when you're talking about human rights, you are always ending up doing that in a uh, situation of privilege. And for me, to, to, to really notice and get conscious of that was actually really helpful. For, because now I, I try to be really sensitive uh, when we talk about agendas that are not uh, directly mine, like indigenous rights, women's rights, uh, rights of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. I'm always very self-conscious of trying not to make the same mistake of, of trying to, to make a ranking of, of human rights, saying, okay, this is not so important as this other sure. agenda. Right. Um, yeah. Now, one thing is, not only are you guys actors in trying to change important things in our society, but you're also observers of what's going on and how leadership is changing in, in, in the way it's exercised in our society. You guys are also young, which is something that you share. Is it possible today to, or, or let me frame it this way, what's the role of the social media in the exercise of leadership today and in the future? Do you, um, you guys are active in social media. What's, what's the role in social media for, for what's coming in terms of the paradigms of, of, of leadership? For me, it's a key aspect of my political work. Um, I, I think that a, a major part of my constituency are young people. Mm -hmm. So for me to have an Instagram account, Facebook, Twitter, is like uh, really important to get my message out. Mm -hmm. um, and also to get feedback. But you al also have to, to, to be really conscious that social media life is not a real life. So you can get yourself in a bubble of love, like, oh, you're the best. Uh, or you can get yourself in a bubble of hate. A lot of uh, conservative people love to interact with me <laughs> in social media for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and, and you really need to, 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 to try to stay balanced. So it's a really important uh, tool, but you really need to, to give it, uh, to, to know where to put it. Right. And to understand that if you want to really represent people, you, it's really important to keep the face-to-face the -face contact and interaction. Uh -huh. So for me, it's actually completely the opposite. Um, even if I have um, active social media, I don't necessarily use it as something to get in touch with people because I haven't seen it necessarily working. Um, in the places where I have been working, luckily, and even in other places, not necessarily everybody has access to social media. And for the things that I'm working, for example, in uh, sex education or women's health or children's health, I've seen more impact in the one-on-one -on -one interactions that actually through social media. 
because in in areas where there's not a lot of education, social media is still used not, not as an education tool, but more as something that you use when you're bored and you're just like scrolling the Facebook or, so it's not necessarily seen as something that can actually educate. I think we can move in that way, but it's not, for me, in the work that I do, it cannot replace actually the one-on-one -on -one interaction that I think has a bigger impact um, it's more difficult because you actually need to resources to actually go to those places. Um, but because I work in a population that is not very big, I think I can do it that way. What I do use social media, and that I think it's very important, is to show the work that we are doing. Why is that? Because NGOs don't, I don't know how it is in other countries, but here in Peru, they are not like the best scene. Um, not mine necessarily, but other NGOs because they have not necessarily used the money in the best way possible or because they are not very uh, transparent about their, uh, their numbers and how they are spending their money. So for me, it's very important to show what we are doing and that we are working all the time so that people don't immediately tend to think the worst about what we're doing because I think people tend to think the worst uh, like in the first step, it's like when we are not doing necessarily something that they want us to do, it's like, well, you're just like spending the money in something that you don't have to do it. So we are, our Facebook is very active just to put pictures on about what we're doing so that parents can see their children and that can be safe and then can think, oh, my children is good today. But also to show that as an NGO, you can be transparent and you can show the things that you're doing and yet you're not hiding. Those, thi those things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, that comes up a lot, or as an uh, as an observer, uh, that I see a lot is that you know dealing with the issues that you guys deal with uh, requires hang handling a lot of complexity, right? And I think this is uh, this is a shared idea across cultures. You know, when you guys are trying to change bar paradigms, you know, whether it's moving uh, society to, be mo to, to, to share other values uh, and to challenge some of the established values of, of this society, you know, homophobia, machismo, all that stuff. Uh, that requires a lot of complexity. But people don't like complexity. People want simple, concrete answers. And that would, would lead, that's what lead leads to uh, a lot of demagogy because people will come up and say hey I have the simple answer and and I don't think that this is also this is only happening in Latin America but it's also happening in places like the US or in Europe how do you handle that 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 sort of paradox right when you are an, on the field on the trenches which is what what you guys are doing you have to deal with a lot of complexity and yet you're the people that you're trying to mobilize want simple, quick answers. How do you how do you handle that paradox? <laughs> There's this uh, word in Spanish, in Peruvian slang, uh, called floro, <laughs> uh, and uh, florero that uh, that person do, that use floro. Floro is like when you have a lot of, uh, of speech. BS. You know, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's a, a, a good way of, of, of putting it. So uh, politicians have quite a, a reputation for that. But it's also really important to, to, to try to, to make a balance between not being a floodo maker and <laughs> <laughs> not being a, a, a demagogue a populist. And one issue where you can really um, measure the, the, the level of, uh, of populism and simple answers uh, that we have in, in Peruvian politics is uh, women issues and the fight against bio, bio, uh, violence. Because um, when each week we have a really awful case in Peru of violence against women. That, that really interpolates uh, and it really qu makes you question about uh, the humanity of, of our society. 
And of course, uh, the media go and, and ask you what you're going to do. And the simple answer that is always been given in, in Peruvian politics is, ah, we're going to be tougher in crime. We're going to have death penalty. Uh, we're going to have longer sentences. We're going to have a, a best, uh, the, the best punity system. And of course, that, that makes a really good headline. Uh, a, politici a politician that is tough in crime is always a good headline for you. Uh, but it doesn't address the problem. And the problem uh, needs uh, us to ask a really complex question. Why, in our society, so many men hit and rape women? And the answer is hurtful and is complex and it's not just a, a newspaper title, but you really need to address the issue and you really need to engage in a public uh, debate about it. And I don't have the, 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 the magic solution in political marketing to, to assure that, that I'm moving forward to, to that uh, goal, but I'm really trying to, to to make the case that we not only need to, to see how we punish the, the person that commit these kind of crimes, but how we make a culture that these kind of crimes doesn't uh, happen at all. So it, it's, a, 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 I think, a, a, a issue that I'm still trying to, to, to move forward, because you, you need to change the politicians' minds, you need to change the way media approach this problem, and of course, you need to cons your constituency to really understand that you are not just making floro, you are trying to really address and uh, answer uh, the, the, the real question mm -hmm. behind this. I think what Alberto is saying is actually very interesting because even if it's in the political way, in the social part, we kind of see it the same way. Um, for me, something that has worked a lot is that people expect you in places of leadership to have all the answers all the time. And that is not only very exhausting, but it's impossible to have all the answers and even to have good answers all the time. So at first, because I was very young, and when you go out of university, you are just like sure that you have all the answers and that you have all your tricks to help people. So you have to start doing it to know that you're not the one that is going to have the answers. And then what I have um, made myself learn is how to ask the good questions. Because a lot of time when people are in leadership positions, they are expected to have answers but they are not necessarily asking questions. And asking questions for me has been the most important thing to keep it real with the people that I'm working with. Um, we talk a lot about how politicians, when they are about to be elected, they go everywhere and they say, oh, I'm going to give you a house, I'm going to give you food, I'm going to give you all of the things that you want to have. And people tend to expect that that's how things are going to work, that everybody's going to give them things. So. I think we have a work um, and we have a role in the place of power, whatever place we have, if it's in a Congress, if it's the president, if it's the, um, the CEO of, of a company, or even someone that just is trying to make a change, to actually, when they want to make a change, to ask the questions about what people are expecting um, and why they are expecting it. Because you can have the first thing that about necessities. So this is what people need. And this is what people think they need in this moment. But then you have to understand what goes beyond that and what is what moves those people to go to those needs. And when you start understanding that, it's easier to start creating with them, with the communities, with the families, and start creating um, solutions that are not possible necessarily, but that can actually be effective because they are going to be done with those communities. So for me, um, what I think works for me is to make sure that I'm working not for other people, but with other people at all times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So before we pass it on to the audience, so we so you guys can also uh, ask some questions. I want to ask you one final question. What is leadership? <laughs> <laughs> You're the experts. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, Juan <laughs> made me that same question uh, three years ago in Georgetown University, uh -huh. and I'm still struggling with, with the answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I can talk about uh, what uh, uh, some uh, elements of, of leadership are important to be a good leader. But uh, I think that, that it's really hard to, to, to try to make a, a, a concept out of, out of it. But I think that it's a concept of execution. It is, uh, leadership is necess necessarily linked to execution and not only to an uh, abstract idea uh, uh, of the concept. Mm -hmm. And for you, Sarah? For me, it's also very difficult, um, but I don't think it's necessarily about execution. Um, I know it's about execution. People have to see you doing things, but for example, or talking, or but just like see you doing. But for example, um, people in the place where I work see me as the leader. So as soon as I'm gonna leave here, I'm gonna go to the NGO and I'm gonna have a lot of people just like asking me questions, uh, trying to make me part of those things. And then in, in the small groups, I start seeing people that are actually making things work. Those that are working and that nobody is seeing it work. You know, the ones that are helping people, that are using their privilege or their own tools to make others grow or to make others work better. And that not necessarily we appreciate them in the way that we should, and at the end, when you try to see how things are working or why something actually worked, you understand, oh, it was that person that nobody was seeing and nobody was saying thanks and nobody was just like looking at that actually make it work. So I think it's also about your willing to make the others great and make the others, um, help the others to be the best at what they can be using your own tools and your privilege and everything that you have in mind, understanding that not necessarily you're gonna be seen, watched, thanked, or anything, but that your purpose that is helping people is gonna work. Um, so for me, I'm seen as a way, but in the community where I work, I see a lot of leaders that are actually doing that. And for me, that's the most valuable thing to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we, I think we have a little time for some questions from you guys, so <laughs> please, if you have questions, um, comments, please. Okay, so for me, I have one that just like pops in mind immediately. Um, that I know that was a turning point for me in the way that I look at things and I see myself too. So in the place where I work is like one hour away from where we are. Um, and it's very different than what you're seeing here um, in the places where you're staying. So one day, I, I don't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday, I was just leaving early at four in the, in the afternoon, because I had a conference in the afternoon, and I wanted to be just like ready and everything. And someone called me and they say, there's a kid that is in danger, that is just like up in the mountain. And that day we didn't have the driver, we didn't have all of those things that you need to actually make things work, we didn't have 
any of those. So I said, okay, I'm just gonna go in my car with my team to see what is going on. Just, that was like five years ago. And I was just like ready to make it work and to do the things that I have to do and to do the things that I was prepared to do. And when I got to the home, it was three families um, of almost four kids in every family. So there were about 14 people living in a home that was smaller than the place where we are right now. All of the kids were sick. There was one baby that was newly born um, that was near death. And families didn't want to leave home because they just bought a fridge and a TV. And they couldn't take the kids to the hospital or they couldn't take the kids to the clinic where they wanted to take it because they didn't want to leave the things behind. And that for me was the turning point because I understood that the way I was looking at things wasn't the right one because I was seeing, everybody tells you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the others, but I don't think that's a good expression. I think you have to put yourself in the skin of the others. And for me, that was a turning point because I arrived with all my strategies and ideas and I was going to tell the people, okay, I'm gonna take you to this hospital, I have my car downstairs, and they didn't want it to leave because they were very scared that they were gonna be robbed. So we had to take all the uh, health system to go to the home and we kept on working with them to understand what was that fear that they had, why they didn't want it to leave, and what made them take those kids to that place where all of them were very sick and had been sick for six months, some of them. For me, that was a turning point. Understanding that I cannot see things from my privilege and that I have to be in their own skin to understand how I can do things for others. From that moment, all of the things that I have been doing change completely. Yeah. So a, a turning point for, for me it was eight years ago. I was still in, in college. I was studying law. I, I was really interested in constitutional law. And I was working in one of the main firms in, in Peru with the best constitutional area. And when I arrived, they told me uh, that uh, they were uh, working with an NGO to promote a non-discrimination law for LGBT people. So I was like, great. And I was, uh, I, 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 I was not openly gay. My friends and family knew I was, I was gay, but it was not like uh, out in the open. Uh, but I was really an activist in, well, social media were starting. I don't know if you remember blogs back in the days. I, I, ha I had a blog, <laughs> and for me, talking about LGBT issues was marriage equality, and that's it. So I started working in this uh, non-discrimination bill, and w part of the, of the process was to go to different parts of Peru and talk directly to LGBT leaders about what they expected of this bill. And that was the first time I, I was eight years ago, 24 years old. It was the first time that I sit in the same table with transgender women from different economic background, uh, different skin color, uh, different uh, life experience. And for me, that was like, really like I discovered a whole different uh, approach and I thought I was like when I was writing in my blog um, talking for the LGBT community and then I discovered I, I knew nothing and I was in a position of privilege that I didn't really understand at the time. So for me I still keep in touch with, with some of the friends I, I made in that experience and it was really important because uh, it teach me a way of how to, 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 to be a leader. Not to do what you think you're expected to do or you think is right, but the things that people want you to do and do it, as Sarah said, with them. 
and not like in a in a in a higher position because uh, you are you, you need to understand that you are really privileged to have a voice in societies like like ours so try that try to 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 make your voice their voice or oh, all the way around <laughs> try their voice to be your voice uh, and for me that was really important Maybe we have time for one more question. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing this morning. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm from South Africa, and interestingly enough, today is National Women's Day back home. And August is Women's Month. And essentially, it's there to raise awareness around women empowerment and all the other issues. Interestingly, though, it is usually in this month that we find the m highest number of gender-based violence, of issues against women. And listening to you, you know, I'm drawing so many parallels between the country there and here. And as a developing country, we have one of the most progressive constitutions. Yet, the higher the awareness, I find, the higher the rate of violence against women and children. I'd like to hear your comments about that. I mean, why? Why is this happening all over the world? I, I, I was thinking about it the, the, the other day, uh, about the, the rate of violence against women, the rate of violence, uh, of sexual violence uh, against uh, underage uh, boys and girls. And I don't know if the rate is higher or the, the, the awareness of the problem and people actually going and, make and filing the, the complaint is higher. I would think it's the second, the second uh, option. Uh, there's, I, I'm actually, uh, right now I'm the chairman of an inquiry committee uh, to study and to investigate uh, child abuse in organizations. So I'm studying also other experiences. And there's the, the Australian uh, Commission that did the, the same work. And what the Australian Commission showed you was a much uh, bigger effort. They it took them three years and a whole team for, for this uh, report. It's all the impunity and all the silence that this, this kind of violence had for the last 60 years. So the, the, the problem was there. So, but we didn't, as a society, as a humankind, we didn't address it, and the victims didn't have a voice. So, so for me, it's really frustrating that, that the level of violence that we live today, but also there's a little hope that now victims can speak and can seek for justice. Not, not necessarily get justice in, in countries like, like, like Peru, but the, 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 main, the, 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 the fact that they can seek justice is a tremendous uh, move forward if we compare ourselves 50 years ago. Um, I'm gonna tell you something very personal from where I have learned things that can happen. So I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And as a survivor, what I've seen as soon as this was open and that I talked to other people was an increase in the way they express their violence towards me, especially men. So I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was that this scared them or this made them feel like I was telling them that they were the ones that were guilty from this. But the first reaction was to get offended from what happened. Just like, well, but are you sure this is what happened? Are you sure it wasn't you the one who started it? So I think um, society is starting to change. But since it's very cultural, I think uh, men and women, too, have to start feeling less attacked every time themselves, every time something like this happens. They have to keep it personal and they have to understand that they have a role in that. If I know that someone is going through that, I have to help him and I have to do something. 
Um, but I think we have to make that change between making it personal and feeling attacked by something that happened. And this is a reaction that I have found a lot with the women that I'm working with. They say, well, as soon as I'm talking about, for example, with my husband, that he cannot longer hit me because uh, I'm listening in the radio and in television that I cannot be hit, he's hitting me harder. So I think what we have to do is to keep working mainly with childhood. I think we have some generations that can be lost sometimes, but I think working with childhood to make sure that our future is gonna be different and that culturally people don't get affected by what happened to others, but that they get personally um, engaged in the things that we have to do for others. And I think um, not only the men have to change, but also the women have to change. And we have to change together. It's not only women asking men to change and to express themselves differently and to act differently, but I think we have a role as a woman to do the same thing. Um, I'm very sorry that that happened in your, in your country, but I know that you're gonna be moving forward. Here, even if we have more and more cases, I think we're moving forward because women are talking more. And that's a big step for a society that actually didn't have a voice before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I think we have to uh, wrap it up. And um, thank you so much for your, for your comments. Thank you so much for being here from flying all the way to, to Peru. I really want to thank our, our panel for their honesty, for their intelligence, for their courage. Um, and one of the things that I take away from this, not just as a citizen of Peru, but also as a part of the world community, is that even though there are moments of despair when we feel, where is this all going? Um, when we hear these stories from people who are in the trenches and who are doing things, there's an element of hope that comes to the heart. So I want to thank you both. Uh, um, I really hope you continue to do all the amazing thing you do and thank you for coming here. Thank you.